Hi everyone, how's it going? I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying your break. I know Jack and I are. He's glad that I'm home spending time with him. Uh, I wanted to give you a couple announcements and also let you know how we're going to finish this week and next week. Um, it appears that Oakton is still flooded. All the parking lots are flooded and Golf and Central roads are closed. So last I heard the campus is closed through Thursday. Um, and I thought rather than trying to do a series of double lectures next week in order to get caught up, I would do a screencast today and present the lecture that I was going to do after the exam this Wednesday. Um, if you didn't get my email, be sure to check that. It has instructions for how we're going to finish this week and next week. Um, the exam is going to be a take-home exam, and that's due on Monday. Um, for this lecture, you should actually answer the iClicker questions as part of the next homework assignment. I will collect those. Also, oh yeah, I want to let you know that this lecture is a little bit faster than normal. Um, it was getting a little bit too long, so I sped up the video and the audio. Um, so if things are going a little bit too fast or you need a little bit more time to think, don't forget to hit that pause button. That's the beauty of technology. All right, let's get started. Say bye, Jack. start by reviewing where we left off last time. We said that allylic systems underwent SN1 and SN2 reactions faster than their saturated counterparts. Here we can see this allylic chloride undergoes ethanolysis 123 times faster than the saturated chloride. If we're doing ethanolysis or any solvolysis reaction, we presume that we're proceeding through a carbocation intermediate, which would explain this relative trend. If I have an allylic chloride, that should lead to an allylic carbocation. Allylic carbocations are more stable, because they have more resonant structures, a more stable intermediate means a more stable transition state, and therefore a faster reaction. We also saw that SN2 reactions were faster for allylic systems than their saturated counterparts. Iodide here adds to the carbon with the leaving group at the same time that the leaving group is leaving. So there's no carbocation intermediate. What can explain this trend then? We said that there were two possible factors. One, was a steric interaction. In an allylic chloride, this carbon is sp2 hybridized, therefore it's flat, and there's less steric hindrance as the nucleophile comes in to do backside attack. This carbon in the saturated compound is sp3 hybridized, therefore the nucleophile experiences more steric repulsion as it attempts to do backside attack during the SN2 process. Our second argument was that the pi bond or a p orbital of the pi bond could overlap with the antibonding molecular orbital of the carbon leaving group bond. The greater that overlap was, the more donation into this carbon leaving group bond, the more donation, the weaker that bond is. The weaker the bond, the faster the nucleophile can break it. Dyings can be classified as isolated, conjugated, or cumulated. In an isolated dying, the p or none of the p orbitals in either pi system are able to overlap with each other. In this case, there's a methylene group in between these two pi systems, so there can be no overlap. In a conjugated dying, the pi systems are adjacent to one another, which means that the p orbitals are able to overlap, increasing delocalization and stability of that system. In a cumulated dying, there's a central carbon atom involved in two separate pi systems. In this case, the blue p orbital and the red p orbital are perpendicular to one another. They themselves do not overlap. Because they're not overlapping, the system then cannot be conjugated. The electron density in the red pi system is not delocalized with the electron density in the blue pi system. When naming dyings using IUPAC nomenclature, be sure to put a di prefix in front of the parent suffix ene and e to indicate that there are two double bonds. Also, if there are easy configurations, those should be listed in parentheses in front of the name. Isolated dyings and conjugated dyings are named in the same way. Because there are no easy configurations possible for accumulated dyne, those configurational descriptors do not appear in that name. Let's compare now the potential energies of dyings, alkenes, and alkanes. We can see that dyings are higher in potential energy 
than alkenes, which are higher in potential energy than alkanes. So as we increase the number of pi bonds, we increase the potential energy. This makes sense because pi bonds are weaker, weaker bonds are higher in potential energy. If we just compare the dienes at the top, we see that 1,4 pentadiene, the isolated system, is higher in energy than 1,3 pentadiene, the conjugated system. And the difference between those two is 26 kilojoules per mole. The question is, what is resulting in that extra stability of 1,3 pentadiene? There's two possibilities. One is that 1,3 pentadiene contains more substituted double bonds. This double bond is monosubstituted. This double bond is disubstituted. Whereas in 1,4 pentadiene, we have two monosubstituted double bonds. So we could reason that more substituted double bonds are more stable, lower in potential energy. We've seen this trend before. The more substituted the double bond, the more electron donation through hyperconjugation, the more stable. The other possibility is that conjugation itself is imparting some extra stability. So we want to determine of this 26 kilojoules per mole difference between 1,3 pentadiene and 1,4 pentadiene, how much is due to substitution and how much is due to conjugation. Well, we can figure out how much is due to substitution by comparing these two systems, 1 pentene and 2 pentene. 1 pentene is a monosubstituted double bond. 2 pentene has a disubstituted double bond. And the difference in energy between these two is 11 kilojoules per mole. The only difference between the substitution in 1,3 pentadiene and 1,4 pentadiene is a monosubstituted double bond or a disubstituted double bond. The same for 1 pentene and 2 pentene. So we could say then, of the 26 kilojoules per mole difference between 1,3 and 1,4 pentadiene, 11 of that is due to substitution. The remaining difference then, 15, is due to conjugation. This is extra stability imparted to this system just because those double bonds are conjugated. We call this delocalization energy, this extra stability resulting from conjugation. Now see if you can place these compounds in order of increasing heat of hydrogenation. Remember the heat of hydrogenation is how much heat is released when we hydrogenate an alkene to an alkane. If we look at the bonding and conjugated dienes, we can see that the carbon-carbon bond distance here is shorter than that of alkanes. Part, this is partially due to the increased S character of each of these carbons. More S character means stronger overlap, stronger bond, shorter bond length. But that doesn't explain why this bond is shorter even than this system between an sp2 hybridized carbon and an sp3. This bond we could argue is shorter because this system is conjugated. Again, if it's conjugated, the electrons in each of these two pi bonds is delocalized over all four of these carbon atoms. That means that the two p orbitals on each of these carbons overlap slightly to induce that conjugation. That slight overlap increases the bond strength between the two and results in a shorter bond. 1,3 dienes can exist in two conformations, S cis and S trans. In between these two conformations is a transition state conformation in which the two pi systems are perpendicular to one another. We can see in this diagram that the S cis and S trans are lower in energy than the conformation where those pi systems are perpendicular. S trans is even lower in energy than S cis by 12 kilojoules per mole. In terms of terminology, the S represents the single bond in between the two pi systems. So if I draw a dotted line through this single bond, I can see that both CH2 groups and S cis are on the same side. They're cis. If I draw a dotted line through the single bond here, the CH2 groups in this conformation are both trans and gives me S trans. The question is, why is S trans lower in energy than S cis? And why are both of these lower in energy than the system where the two pi systems are perpendicular? If I look at Newman projections of all three of these, we can clearly see why S trans is lower in energy than S cis. Here, the two CH2 groups are anti to one another, and so they experience less steric repulsion. In the S cis conformation, those two CH2 groups are eclipsed and therefore experience more steric repulsion. In the transition state in between those two, we can see that the pi systems are perpendicular, and there's very little 
spheric propulsion between the CH2 groups, so there must be another explanation for why this conformation is higher in energy than either of the two bottlenecks. If we look at a molecular orbital diagram, we can see that both in S cis and in S trans, all four p orbitals are parallel to one another. That means that we can efficiently overlap in between the two pi systems, which gives me a conjugated system. A conjugated system has extra stability. It has that delocalization energy. The same is true for S trans. I can overlap in between these two pi systems when these two p orbitals are parallel to one another. In the conformation in between these, however, if I rotate around this single bond, these p orbitals then become perpendicular, no overlap, no conjugation, no extra stability. And then finally, if we look at our last type of dyne, a cumulated dyne, specifically an alene, we see some unique features. Um, we see that the bond length is actually shorter for the carbon-carbon double bond than even a conjugated system. Here, these carbons have the most S character, this carbon at 50%, this at 33%. Again, more S character means better overlap, which means a stronger bond, which means shorter bond length. Alenes do not have any major conformations because I can't rotate around either carbon-carbon double bond in the system. However, it does lead to some unique configurational structures for alenes. We can see that the CH2 group at carbon-1 forms a plane which is perpendicular to the plane formed by the CH2 group at the other end of the alene. Alenes, then, are non-planar. The two pi bonds are, again, perpendicular to one another, as we can see in this bottom diagram. We have side-to-side -side overlap between the two p orbitals of the green pi system, and side-to-side -side overlap between the p orbitals of the yellow pi system, which are coming in and out of the plane of the screen. But the green p orbital and the yellow p orbital do not overlap. Again, this is not a conjugate system. There's no shared delocalization between the electrons in the green pi system and the electrons in the yellow pi system. Are aliens stabilized by delocalization energy? The answer simply is no. Those systems are perpendicular, no overlap, no delocalization. Another unique feature of aliens is that they can be chiral if we have substituents on these terminal carbon atoms. Here we have 2,3-pentadiene, which is an enantiomer of this 2,3-pentadiene. Enantiomers are non-superimposed vulgar images. Not all aliens are chiral, but some of them can be. See if you can decide which of the dines in this list is kind of. I highly recommend you draw all of these out. Alkanes undergo dehydrogenation at high temperatures in the presence of a metal catalyst. This reaction, like dehydrogenation to alkenes, is only useful if there's only one product possible. We won't learn the mechanism for this reaction. Dehydration also occurs with allylic alcohols and homoallylic alcohols. We can see here that this is a homoallylic alcohol. This would be the allylic carbon. This is the homoallylic carbon, one position from the allylic. And in this case, if we protonate that alcohol with potassium hydrogen sulfate, we'd get a carbocation, and then elimination would give us the conjugated diene as the major product. Notice that if this is the alpha carbon, I have beta hydrogens here at the allylic carbon, and beta hydrogens here. Dehydration takes place regioselectively so that I eliminate an allylic beta hydrogen to give me the conjugated diene. Dehydrohalogenation, which is an E2 mechanism, also occurs regioselectively to give me the 1,3 conjugated dyne regioselectively. Here again, I have a homoallylic chloride. I could do beta elimination to give me the conjugated system by removing a beta hydrogen here, or beta deprotonation here to give me this 1,4 dyne system. This reaction is regioselective. The conjugated system is the major product. We can also add hydrogen halides across dynes in the same fashion that we would alkenes. Here I have a 1,3 dyne, and if I do Markovnikov addition of HBr to this dyne, I might expect this product, and only this product. We can see in this case, however, 
if I add HBr to this alkene. Again, you might expect to protonate the least, carbon 1, and for bromide to add to the most substituted carbocation at carbon 2 to give you this product. It turns out there's an additional product for this reaction, which is this one here. These are called 1-2 addition and 1-4 addition. In the 1-2 addition, we're adding across only this double bond. In the 1-4 addition, we actually rearrange the carbocation intermediate so that bromide could add a carbon 4. We'll look at the mechanism in just a second. Under kinetic control at low temperatures, we obtain 1-2 addition products. Under thermodynamic conditions, at high temperatures and reversible conditions, we obtain 1,4 addition products. In the case of 1,2 addition, we protonated carbon 1, and it appears that bromide added to carbon 2. In the case of 1,4 addition, we protonated carbon 1, and bromide added to carbon 4. If we look at the mechanism for this reaction, we can see that if we protonate this alkene with HBr, again, protonating the least, so that I get the most substituted carbocation. Because this is an allylic system, an allylic carbocation, there are two resonance structures that I can draw, which means that bromide could either add to carbon two, or it could add to carbon four, to give me the two products that I saw in the previous slides. What determines the course of this reaction depends on the conditions. Under kinetic control, when we have low temperatures and the reaction is irreversible, the intermediate will go through the pathway that's the lowest in energy in this case, the blue line shown here. That occurs when bromide adds to carbon-2. The question is, why is that a lower energy pathway than when bromide adds to carbon-1? Well, if we look at these two resonance structures, we can see, sorry, not carbon-4, we can see that carbon-4 is primary, carbon-2 secondary. So when bromide's adding to a carbocation, the carbon is becoming neutral, so it's partially positively charged. Bromide is becoming neutral, so it's partially negatively charged. And the lower energy transition state will be the one that has the most substituted partially positively charged carbon, which is this one in the blue box here. In other words, bromide adds to the most substituted carbocation resonance structure. That's the lowest energy pathway. And that gives me the kinetic product. Now it turns out in this case, the kinetic product is also higher in energy than the thermodynamic product. It's higher in energy because it's a monosubstituted double bond, whereas this product is a disubstituted double bond. But the energy of the products does not determine the course of the reaction under kinetic control, only the lowest energy pathway. So in summary, kinetic control means 1-2 addition. Protonate the least, and bromide adds to the most. And in this case, when it adds to the most, that also happens to be the most substituted carbocation. This reaction must be irreversible for, the, for these conditions to lead to the kinetic product. Irreversible means there's no equilibrium. This is a one-way process from reactants to products. Under thermodynamic control, we follow the red path. Now bromide has can add to, again, either the secondary carbocation resonance structure or the primary carbocation resonance structure. It follows a higher energy pathway under thermodynamic control because then it can get to the most stable product, the thermodynamic product. In this case, if this reaction is conducted at high temperature, and high temperature often just refers to room temperature, then this process is reversible. It moves back and forth. There's an equilibrium. If that's true, then that means that the kinetic products, when they're initially formed, return to reactants faster. If that's true, then eventually all of our reactants get filtered to the thermodynamic product. Sometimes the way that I think of it, even though this may not be true, is that under thermodynamic control, the kinetic products have enough energy to get back over this hill and this hill to get me to reactants, whereas the thermodynamic products do not have enough energy to get back over the red hump. That means that as more products are formed through each cycle, we have this trap where thermodynamic products cannot return to reactants. Again, the key here is under thermodynamic control, the reaction must be reversible. If we look at this example, we can see that here we're adding HBr across this conjugated dye at 25 degrees Celsius. We'll assume that that's thermodynamic control. That's a fairly high temperature. Thermodynamic control is one for addition. Protonate the least, always, and then bromide adds to the least substituted carbocation resonance structure so that when I, that double bond moves to that position, I get the most substituted alkene as a product. Under kinetic control, low temperatures, 
in this case minus 78 degrees Celsius, I still protonate the least, but now bromide adds to the most substituted carbocation resonance structure because that's the lower energy pathway. And under kinetic control, I have just barely enough energy to get over the lowest energy pathway. That's one two addition, and that's called the kinetic product. The addition of hydrogen halides to conjugated dienes is only really useful in synthesis if there's only one carbocation intermediate. So in this case, we actually have two different double bonds. Here's a mono-substituted double bond. Here's a di-substituted double bond. Each of those, when protonated, will lead to separate carbocation intermediates. In the top case, let's imagine this double bond on the right being protonated. Again, Markovnikov addition says protonate the least. So then I get the most substituted carbocation. And because this is an allylic system, I have two resonance structures that I can draw. If we're under thermodynamic control, bromide adds to the least substituted carbocation resonance structure, so that I get the most substituted product, which is more stable. If we're under kinetic control, bromide adds to the more substituted carbocation resonance structure, which has the lower energy pathway to give me only the kinetic product, one, two addition. Both of these products could be obtained then just through reaction of this alkene on the right in this conjugated dye. But it's reasonable that this other alkene would also react. It would get protonated at the least substituted carbon to give me the most substituted carbocation, which has two resonance structures of its own, each of these leading to 1, 2, and 1, 4 addition products. What that means then is if we added HBr to this conjugated dye, under kinetic control, I'd get two products. There's two 1, 2 addition products. Under thermodynamic control, there are two 1, 4 addition products. In other words, this reaction would not be very useful because I get a mixture. All right, now see if you can decide. What is the kinetic product for HBr addition of this conjugated ion? Is there only one kinetic product or are there two? Draw the mechanism for this reaction and then predict the product. reaction we'll look at is the Diels-Alder reaction. Uh, this is a famous reaction discovered by chemists Diels and Alder, and it's another way that we can create carbon-carbon bonds. Again, our holy grail of organic chemistry. This reaction is known as a cycloaddition, which is defined as any reaction of two or more pi systems. So in a Diels-Alder reaction, we can see that we have a conjugated 1,3-diene reacting with a simple alkene. These two pieces are called the diene and the dienophile, right? The dienophile is the lover of the diene. This reaction is also a pericyclic reaction. It's concerted. All of the ste steps taking place here happen at the same time. In a pericyclic reaction, we have a cyclic transition state. So if we look at the mechanism, we can see that this double bond is swinging up here. And again, if I think of a double bond like a door on a hinge, my hinge is at this carbon. So these two electrons are swinging in this direction to form a new bond to this carbon of the dyne. These electrons move here to make room, pushing these electrons here to form a new bond to this carbon. That works out nicely because this carbon was losing a bond anyway from that first move. If we draw the transition state, it looks like this. And unlike most of the transition states we've seen already, this one is nonpolar. There's no partial positive or negative charges. Here we can see that the two sigma bonds are being formed at the same time. And since I'm combining four carbons with two, I get a six-membered ring. Here's the new pi bond that I've created, and I call this a Diels Alder adduct. Any cyclohexene ring then is a potential product of a Diels Alder reaction. A Diels Alder reaction can be stereospecific. In other words, the stereoisomers of the products that I get can depend upon the stereoisomers of the reactants that I start with. In this case, I have a trans relationship between this methyl group and the aldehyde in this deals all the reaction. This trans relationship depends upon the trans relationship of the reactant, stereospecific. Again, in the diene, we're forming new bonds between the terminal carbons of the diene and the carbons of the alkene, here and here. In this case, I can see that the two groups on my dienophile, the methyl group and the nitrile group, are now cis to one another. So that after this deals all the reaction, these groups remain cis to one another. Again, this is stereospecific. The relationship between those two groups in the product depends upon the relationship between those two groups in the reactants. 
The reason that ideals all the reaction is stereospecific, again, is because it's concerted. These two sigma bonds are being formed at the same time. And they're being formed by overlap of the pi system of the alkene with the pi system of the diene. You can see that the p orbitals here have to overlap with the bottom lobes of the p orbitals of the diene here. Again, here's that transition state. If all of this is happening at the same time, there's never an opportunity then to rotate around this single bond. Clearly, I can't rotate around a double bond. And there's no way to rotate around this single bond once I formed a six-membered ring. That means that the relationship between these two groups is the same in the products as they were in the reactants. All right, now you predict the product. First, though, you have to determine what's the product after treatment of this vicinal dihalide with sodium methoxide. Then, how does that react with my dienophile Z2-pentene? Be careful. Make sure you're considering the stereospecificity of this reaction. Interestingly enough, if we just reacted ethylene here with 1,3-butadiene, no reaction would take place under normal circumstances. This deals all the reaction. It's too slow. We need to find some way to increase the reactivity of either the diene or the diene file, the alkene. This is typically done by adding electron withdrawing groups to the diene file. Examples of electron withdrawing groups are pi systems, like carbonyl groups. Remember, a carbonyl carbon has partial positive charge because I can draw resonance structures where the oxygen is negative and the carbon is positive. Nitro groups are one of the most electron withdrawing groups in organic chemistry. If you draw the Lewis structure for a nitro group, you can see that there's a formal positive charge on nitrogen. Cyano groups are also electron withdrawing as they're pi systems. All of these increase the potential energy of the dienophile and increase the reactivity. In contrast, on the diene, we need to add electron donating groups to increase its reactivity. Examples of electron donating groups are methyl. It can donate through hyperconjugation, as we've seen before. Methoxy groups are electron donating because they have electron lone pairs on the oxygen, which they can donate towards that pi system. In essence, anything with an electron lone pair can be an electron donating group, such as an amino group. The fastest reactions, then, are those in which the dienophile has electron withdrawing groups and the diene has electron donating groups. If you're curious as to why electron withdrawing groups increase the reactivity of dienophiles and electron donating groups increase the reactivity of dienes, take a look at the rest of the lecture slides, which will be posted online. I won't ask you to know any of this information for any future quizzes or exams, but it's there if you'd like to look at it. Now, which of the following dienes in this list would you expect to be the least reactive based on our previous discussion? Here's a little bit more complex example of a diels alder reaction. A dienophile doesn't have to be an alkene. In this example, the dienophile is an alkyne with two electron withdrawing carbonyl groups attached. The mechanism is the same. The pi bond in the dienophile is used to form a new sigma bond to the carbon of the diene, pushing this pair of electrons here, pushing this pair of electrons on this pi bond over to this carbon to form a new sigma bond. Again, I'm forming two new sigma bonds to the end carbons of the alkene and the diene. Since I'm only breaking one pi bond in this alkyne, though, I should be left with one in the product. So in this case, my diels alder adduct is not a cyclohexene, but a 1,3 cyclohexadiene. There are two double bonds in this six-membered ring, which are opposite to one another. When we're thinking about diels alder reactions, then, in synthesis, we start with the cyclohexene ring. Each time we see a cyclohexene ring, we think to ourselves, I probably can make that using a diels alder reaction. In order to determine what the reactants are, I have to think backwards. In other words, I do a retro diels alder If I move that double bond here, and break this bond, and break this bond, I think you can see that the pieces that I would need are this diene and this diene file, for my simplest case. If I apply that here, how could I convert this alkyne into this cyclohexane ring? Well, as I begin my synthesis, first I realize I don't have a diels alder adduct. This is a cyclohexane ring. Cyclohexene rings are diels alder adducts. But I could probably easily convert a cyclohexene ring into a cyclohexane ring through hydrogenation. The question is where to put the double bond. Well, the double bond typically is opposite to the two carbons that have the functional groups attached to them, in this case cyano and methyl. If I work backwards, doing my retro diels alder my backwards diels alder analysis. If this pi bond moves here, and this bond breaks, moving here, 
and this bond breaks, moving here, I think you can see the two pieces that I would need are this dyne, one three butadiene, and this alkene, this dienophile. But I haven't been given this dienophile in my reactant. So the question is, can I make this from this? And the answer is yes. We've already learned how to make cis alkenes from alkynes. We could use Lindlar's catalyst to do a stereoselective hydrogenation to the cis alkene. In the forward reaction, then, I start with the alkyne, Lindlar's reduction with palladium on calcium carbonate, and using quinoline and lead tetraacetate as poisons will give me the cis alkene. Then, a deals alder reaction with 1,3-butadiene will give me the cyclohexene, and reduction of that double bond with palladium on carbon and hydrogen gas gives me the cyclohexane. Now you predict the product. Although it looks like this could be the dienophile in a deals alder reaction, it's likely that this is the dienophile, because it contains two electron withdrawing groups, which increase its reactivity. All right, that does it, guys. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'll be on Skype all week and start working on that exam. It'll be due during class on Monday. Have a great weekend. Bye. Say bye, Chip.